This week on Downloaded, we've got Paul Siglia, who sued Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. That story's big, we'll be talking about that. Then the effect of Hurricane Sandy on New York data centers. And finally, we have the biggest, smallest, best group of screens from the iPad mini to Nexuses and everything else you wanna see, so stick around. Welcome to Downloaded. This is the show where we're gonna cover all the great new tech stories of the week with some of the best tech people ever. So the first person I hear today, Nathan Olivares Giles, writer at Wired Digital and host of Gadget Lab. It's great to have you here, thanks. Don't thanks. take a drink, I'm introducing you. <laughs> Sorry. You can drink too now. Too soon, too soon. You can soon. drink now. All right, uh, all right. And uh, one of my favorite folks ever, uh, ex-CEO of Sun Microsystems, Jonathan Schwartz is here. He's now CEO of CareZone. And we're gonna learn a lot more about that right now. Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, so let's get right into it. We're going to hop into Tech Radar. We're going to run down some of the bigger tech stories of the week. And I got to say, um, this is obviously not a tech story this week, but Jonathan, I love your haiku when you left as CEO of Oracle. It's financial crisis, stalled too many customers, CEO no more. Uh, I just thought that was just totally awesome. Um, at, but so it's been about two years. What have you been doing? Uh, a lot of stuff. Um, getting my head back in order, mm -hmm. um, figuring out what's important to me, and just um, plowing ahead on a new little company called CareZone. Yeah, so CareZone's really interesting. Tell me about what the sort of genesis of that was and where it came from, what the, you guys The are genesis doing. was uh, my wife and I had a child about a little over a decade ago um, who had a bunch of issues. And so if you've had a child, I mean, this is not uncommon, mm -hmm. you know, life happens. I have a 13 year old, I know there okay. are issues. So, so you inevitably end up with the pile of stuff that, you know, on the one hand, you want to keep secure, but on the other hand, you want to share because there's maybe a babysitter or a caregiver and you want like a really secure place where you can keep it, but you still want to make it accessible in a digital world. So, where would you do that? And you're not gonna go set up an account for your child on Facebook and say, oh, I'm gonna right, invite right, all right. the caregivers and whatever. So we wanted a, a central place to go put stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, one day my, my parents just decided to get old, like one day. And all of a sudden we had the same set of concerns. We got, now we got bank passwords and account passwords and documents and stuff, and where do you put that? And so we, my partner and I, Walter, uh, Walter Smith, just wanted to have a safe place, free from ads, totally private, secure, but easily shareable with non-technical people. So if you've got a sister in Kansas or an aunt in Maine, you send her an invite, she gets on board, she can look at stuff, she can get access to it, life is easy. Well, I, and I totally get it. Uh, I was, um, my mom just sent me, she, you know, she lives in New Hampshire on her own, and she just sent me the names of two friends with their phone number saying, here they are, the people to be in touch with. Where are you gonna put that? Now I know where I'm gonna put it. <laughs> there you I go. am uh, gonna put it on CareZone. Um, all right, let's move on to our next story of the week here. We're gonna talk about Facebook. And uh, this guy, Paul, um, sued Facebook for half the company, just got arrested for forgery. You guys heard about this story. Pretty amazing. I mean, he was arrested for forgery on this because of the Facebook thing. Now, like, this guy is not a saint. So early on, a couple years ago, he got busted for 400 grams of mushrooms. Uh, he and his wife charged with fraud, larceny. The thing that took me in this story, though, is the law firm. I mean, he had this high-end law firm that was representing him. I mean, Nathan, did this law firm be held to account, too? Well, you know, that's that's a pretty decent question. Um, over the last few years that this has been playing out, Segley has jumped from law firm to law firm. Yeah. And, you know, how much he's actually disclosing to his lawyers is a question I think you gotta ask too. So I feel for for Zuckerberg, I feel for Facebook. I mean, when you were at Sun and other I mean you must have seen a lot of these spurious uh, lawsuits. I mean, oh, tons. Absolutely. Is this the worst you've seen? This would definitely rank up there, and I think the thing to, uh, that you just pointed out, who is it that represented him? I, I can't remember the name, though. It was a pretty blue chip one. I was just it's looking a big, at it. I think it was a, a big of, He's firm. had a lot of big firms. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Keep, you talk, yeah. I'll and look. And so, for the most part, when, you know, and mostly what we faced when I was at Sun, where you, you know, I've got a patent troll who goes to the yeah. Eastern District in Texas with some, you know, uh, no-name law firm, and they just come banging on your door because they want to check. And I think it's very different when you have a, you know, top-tier, top-shelf law firm representing you. And I mean, lawyers have to do due diligence just as much as clients have to do due diligence. So yeah, exactly. This is a little surprising. So look at this. His eighth law firm just said they don't want to represent him. <laughs> eight, I mean, he went through eight lawyers. That's pretty wild. You got well, it. Yeah. It's that great quote. Was the difference between humans and white mice? What? White white mice learn. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, you know, it seems like there should be some. There would be some way to stop these spurious lawsuits from really affecting what's going on. I mean, we see this all the time. We see it with patent trolls. We see it's all sorts of things. Um, Nathan, you got a solution for us on this one? You know, it, it's, it's a huge pain. Um, that's something that Wired's actually covering in a series and just kind of challenging the ideas of, of what, what is the purpose of patents? Are we patenting the problem or are we patenting the solution? Right. Um, and, and how should these things be shared? How should they be licensed? Actually, the FTC is supposedly, um, you know, reportedly considering a lawsuit against Google 
because of claims that they aren't licensing their patents on a fair basis. So what is a fair basis? If these are utility patents that everyone needs to build a smartphone or a tablet, what are the right terms? And of course, if you're trying to license out your patents, you probably think they're a little bit you know, more expensive than the guys who are trying to license them from the company who owns the patents in the first place. Yeah, Jonathan, you, you, you had a yeah, lot of patent licensing stuff world. in your patents. Yeah. It was your world for a long time. What's your solution for this problem? Or do you have a solution? It's just intractable. I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, th I think on the one hand, you know, every, every patent suit has two sides, obviously. I think there are some things that were really egregious, like somebody claims that you're violating their patents, but you can't actually see the code that would implement the patent that they're claiming you're mm -hmm. violating. And I think one of the solutions on the software patent side, leaving aside the kind of arguments around, should we allow software patents, is publish the code. If right, the code is available, right. and then I can actually see where you believe I'm, I'm transgressing or I'm reading on your work, I can just change my work and no longer deal with it. And I think the kind of hide it and later we'll go explode in front of your face is part of the problem. Yeah, transparency and publish, which is a huge part of what you've been doing through most of your career, which is, which is tremendous. Uh, we're going to move on to our uh, next story here, which is about uh, Apple Maps and uh, Guy Scott over at Apple who, uh, who left Apple. Uh, it was responsible for Apple Maps, responsible for Siri. Look, app, the new Apple Maps, not perfect. Jonathan, you, um, you're on your way over here from downtown San Francisco. We're a little bit further south of uh, downtown, still in San Francisco. And it wanted you to go over the Bay Bridge? Well, yeah. I, what? So my uh, care zone's located over in the Mission. And, yeah. and so I said, you know, here's the address. And it said, great, here's the map. And I looked at it, I was like, you want me to go to Treasure Island, which is an island off the coast of San Francisco. Yeah. Get there, make a U-turn, come back into the city and arrive at your office. So yeah, I think that's worth apologizing over. <laughs> but he didn't apologize. And you know, it's hard to know. Is that really the reason why the yeah. company let him go because he refused to apologize? I mean, you never really know. I mean, Wait, what, Nathan, you've, you've, you've got uh, some issues here with the maps as well, uh, right? I mean, they're atrociously bad. I, I rely on public transit pretty <laughs> much every single day, and there are no public transit direction, directions at all. Yeah. So it's basically useless to me. But uh, again, with the Forstall thing, I mean, there's got to be more background there. I mean, he's not a well liked guy at Apple. I guess he was a bit pushy. But, you know, a lot of executives at Apple kind of have that reputation, well, I was say, including Steve Apple. Jobs. <laughs> it kind of yeah. makes some sense. Well, and, I, and, and you're never going to know because, right. you know, ultimately, Tim Cook's got to make decisions about who the right folks on his team are. And for whatever reason, he decided Scott wasn't the right person on his yeah. team. He made a decision. Well, and you knew Steve Jobs well. And um, you built software for Next. You, uh, you've, um, uh, you've got a bunch of blog posts about your interactions with Steve, yeah. which are really interesting. I mean, it's, is this the kind of guy you think you'd protect or it just, you just don't know? I, I mean, I, Steve was a bit fussy when it came to quality, so I yeah. think he'd have a hard time with anybody producing something of the quality of maps. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know. I think he's a, he's a controversial individual, and maybe he's a little, you know, not doing a good job building a team and building a future. And Tim's got to worry about the future, not just the instant that this guy is behaving badly. Yeah, exactly. Now, one of the things that's coming out as well is the design <laughs> and the fact that uh, Scott uh, Forstall was a big fan of so design using textures from the real world. So leather textures on the background yeah. of video and things like that. It's, it, that's been sort of, you know, it may, we may be moving away from that. I look at what Google's doing with Android, and it's very sort of sharp and shiny. Do you think those design issues were a big part of it, Jonathan? I, look, I, I think one of the challenges among many that Apple has is you have a singular decision maker who had a really strong yeah. opinion that would galvanize everybody, and everybody knew what the answer was. And I think one of the challenges that Tim Cook faces is he's not that individual. So he's going to try to delegate that. As soon as you try delegating, now you've got two voices right. instead of one. You've got you know, the design group and the marketing group and the engineering group, and how do you bring it all together? So I think certainly that creates a bigger challenge for Tim Cook. On the other hand, their recent financials haven't demonstrated much of a challenge for anything. Yeah, right, so. right. I, look, you were, you were there running a company at Sun. Yeah. You had those same challenges where people come and say, we want to do this, we want to do this, yeah. where do we go? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, it, you've never steered a car with a committee. You're not going to steer a business with a committee. So you've got to have a driver. You've got this one individual who's making all the calls. I think that's a lot less clear right now in Apple. Who's making those calls and how do they get made? Well, and even on design, who is the design director? Uh, Nathan, you're not a big fan of those textures, right? No, I can't say that I'm a big fan of, you know, like seeing stitching, the skeuomorphic design. Like, I don't yeah. need my calendar to actually look like it's paper and leather. I, I really appreciate what Android's doing. Windows Phone is doing some really great stuff. Getting away from the Chrome, using a lot, you know, brighter colors, more flat textures. It's beautiful. And I think you're going to see that on Apple's side because the guy who is basically taking over Forstall's job is Johnny Ive, right? right? And he is the hardware guy. Now he's overseeing all the software. And how does his hardware look? It's minimal. It's beautiful. There's not a lot of flamboyant, you know, over-the-top kind of textures. It's really simple stuff. So I think you're probably going to see that on the software side. It's really interesting seeing this next generation of devices and the software coming out. Um, not a lot of open source out there, is there, anymore? 
Where? You mean I mean, in, on these in devices, the devices? On these small devices? Mobile I think devices I just, in general? You know, I just I got my Nest thermostat, and, and then I went and read all the open source licenses that my Nest thermostat are, you know, is being shipped under. So I think it's everywhere. It's just not necessarily the entire platform. Yeah. yeah I, just, I, I just think a lot of the open source stuff that I know you've been a big proponent of, I can't really go out on my Apple device and put up open source software on it. Right, right but your Apple device is still built with a lot of open yeah, source true. stuff. This is true. This is true. Um, so we are seeing a, a very interesting battle between Android and iOS. New devices just came out. One of the devices we just got our hands on uh, is the new mini iPad. So we're going to take a look at that right now, and then we're going to come back and talk about that and some of the other devices. Well, it's not Android. It feels a lot like a Nexus 7, except a little bit too wide for me to fit in the palm of my hand. I have no tablet yet, so I'm currently in the market. And actually, I was looking at the 7-inch tablet from Nexus. I guess I could play around with this a little bit longer, but... I don't like the screen. I can actually see the pixelization in the screen, which makes sense, because it's basically just a... Um, it's just a 1040 screen blown up to this size, so that's not too cool. I'd prefer it to be a bit thinner, easier to hold with one hand. It seems like I'm going to drop it. Uh, I'm a big believer in this form factor, obviously, despite what Tim Cook says in his most delusional state. If I had to, I could, I could live with this, but I would prefer to use my money on a Nexus 7. Yeah, but aside from that, I really like the way that the back is polished and it's pretty thin. But something seems off. I just feel like the dimensions are a little bit, a little bit off to me. So the iPad Mini just came out. We actually have an iPad Mini here as well, uh, which uh, we've been playing with. I've got the iPad Mini, which I wanted to show you. Which this is a really cool device. Let's move some of these bottles over so you can take a look at it. Um, but it's a little big. I'm going to pull this out. I'm also going to pull out. This is not my iPad Mini. I am in many ways the anti-Apple guy. So I've got the Nexus 7, which I like a lot better. Um, Nathan, you've played with both these devices. What do you think? You know, it, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. If you already live in the Apple ecosystem, the iPad Mini, it makes a lot of sense. But for me, it's the Nexus 7. It's a lot easier to hold with one hand. It's 130 bucks less. And, you know, it's great for reading. It's really super friendly to just throw in your back pocket. You can carry it with you everywhere. The iPad Mini is beautiful. It's thin. It's light. It's a gorgeous piece of hardware. The thing I like about the Nexus is it is actually not as wide. So you can actually stick it in your pocket. Now, the screen isn't as big, obviously, but you can stick it in your pocket. Are you using either of these yet, Jonathan? Uh, no, not the mini. I mean, an iPad and an iPhone. I'm living in the Apple ecosystem, and it's got <laughs> pluses and minuses. Yeah. So what do you think about a form factor of this type? Well, well here. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I love the... You're never going to have one answer for everybody. I mean, you're always going to have folks who have, you know, preferences on one side or the other. So I think there's, you know, one of the things that Android has going forward is just the, the ocean of devices that are going to be running Android. You're going to have everything from the thinnest possible to the, you know, the widest and broadest possible. And I think at the end of the day, that's going to be really hard to compete against. But look, there's a software issue. Nathan, you've been talking about this when you reviewed the latest Google Nexus devices, which you actually have some of those as well, yeah. which is really cool. This is like a, a this is a yeah. cavalcade of new screens. So this is the Nexus 10. It's uh, essentially Google's answer again, yet again, to the iPad. It's beautiful. It actually has a higher res display than the iPad 3 and 4. It's oh. gorgeous, but I still don't think there's enough tablet optimized apps. And that's the app problem that you were talking about. So tell I me. I think it's a problem. Well, I mean, the, 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 the problem is just like, oh my God, history repeats. Um, <laughs> you know, so we, you know, at Sun, we had Java running on every device known to man, and the upside was it had this incredible distribution. The downside was every device was a little bit different. Right. Yes. So yeah, Google, exactly what you're seeing with Android. And Google repeated it. Totally. <laughs> and Apple yeah. had the luxury of saying, no, one device. That's it. That's all you have to worry about. One and device, so when, one screen size, one resolution. But now we've got three screen sizes. From Apple. But We've you don't, because they're, they're still the same platform. The mini yeah. and the iPad are the same platform. So they're, they're actually working hard to reduce that fragmentation. And so as an app developer, you know, we're going to deliver our app for iPhone and the iOS first, because yeah. it's very clear what you get when you do that. Now, on the Android side, it's like, well, which one and which variant and which version, which manufacturer? It just gets harder. Yeah, I hear you. But you know, in the end, when it's done right, it's beautiful. We were talking about Nest a little bit, so I had to show you. Not. Yes, I have a Nest. We were talking, you've got this stuff as well. And when you do it well, it doesn't really even matter what the OS is, right? Because uh, I, the I totally agree. Well, and I, and I think this is why, at the end of the day, Android wins. Because yeah. they, they drive the, the marginal cost of that device into the ground. They proliferate everywhere in the world. And then from there, it's going to be a lot easier to build up than it is to take from you know, a premium device and try to move down. It's just a lot harder to go. You know, one of the strange bedfellows we're seeing in this world that uh, came out this week, so that new Mini right there from Apple, running a Samsung processor. Surprise, gentlemen? Yeah. 
No, not at all. I mean, you're going to make the choices that optimize the experience. But at the end of the day, those choices, there are not that many to pick from. I mean, how many yeah. microprocessor vendors are available to help you go power a device like that? Not that many. Well, there are a couple. There are a couple. What do you think? Is it the right choice for a processor? You know, I think Apple has shown with their financials that they make a really good you know, decision when it comes to making cost-effective decisions and powerful decisions. So Samsung makes the displays for a lot of these iPads. Yep. They also make the processors. But Samsung, there is such a battle, though. I mean, they're, Samsung, they're in a Apple, huge, like they're this. In a huge battle. You stole my design. We but hate you. Boom. But they're their biggest rivals, but they're also their biggest business partners on the hardware side, too, because no one's really making... I mean, they use LG displays a lot, and oddly enough, you know, Google went with LG for the new Nexus 4 smartphone. Yep. But, you know, Apple's not going to build their own display factory, their own microprocessor factory. They're going to the best that, vendors available. Yeah, and, the, and the, the scale economy is required if you're going to be in the hardware business. Like most folks don't understand this, but when you when you are reducing the you know the the, the software units you ship mm -hmm. into the marketplace, you're ultimately reduced to if you sell one, the cost of that one copy is the cost of all of your people. Right. You know, and that's it. Well, when you're producing a device like this, you've got not only the cost of your development to worry about, you've got the cost of the fab. Mm -hmm. You've got the cost of all the scale infrastructure that goes in around it. So you're gonna go, and the cost, by the way, you know, escalated at amazing rates. So unless you're getting the highest volume supplier, you're going to end up with much higher components, which means you're not going to be able to get to the 399 or 299 right. price point. Otherwise, you're going to be losing money on every device you ship. How long ago do you think uh, Apple made the decision to put that processor? Like, when was that design decision made? You know, from building hardware, it could be a year or two ago, right? Uh, absolutely. And I, look, I think that the spin times on on consumer electronics are very different than the spin times on a on an enterprise device. So, but still, I'm sure they were making the decision, as you said. It's like they want the right spec and the right product. And look, do the guys on the supply chain actually give a crap about the, the litigation no. between the companies? No, care. they care about trying to get the right spec into the right part. Not remotely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's move on to our big story of the week here, which is the Hurricane Sandy back in the East Coast. And uh, specifically, what happened to the internet in New York when Hurricane Sandy sort of washed up on shore in lower Manhattan? Took out about 10% of the internet, flooded the subways, Nathan, one of the things you worked on uh, when you were at the Times, I thought was great, was this series on going to the end of the line, where you went to the end of every subway system and saw what was there. Yeah. Um, what do you think is going on in the subways right there with the technology there? And you know, you went to you went to South, uh, you know, the one at the end of uh, Staten Island. Staten Island. You were yeah. down at uh, South Ferry. You were out in um, uh, Rockaways. Out at. Uh, Howard Beach, that's the end of that station. I mean, yeah. what do you think is, I mean, what? I mean that, that was a couple years ago. I worked with a lot of colleagues on that project and went all over the place. But, you know, it's such a big, intricate public transit system. I can't even imagine those old, old tunnels just yeah. being filled with water, no. you know, uh, a, a ton of debris. You have, you know, stuff coming in from the outside. Uh, it, it's, it's, the stuff that we've seen looks like a disaster movie. I mean, it yeah. Yeah, looks like that. Look at amazing stories about data centers going down, right? Totally. Uh, so, data center for Huff, Huffington Post, Gawker, BuzzFeed. Trello. Trello went down. Trello. <laughs> right. And so, Did you guys go down? Well, so Trello is... Oh, Trello is your... It, it's the way people build software nowadays. Right, yeah. I mean, it's where you define everything that needs to get done, all the bugs you got to... And it all went down. So, there was this... You know, Mikhail DeCaza had this great, you know, tweet. Now we have to code. <laughs> right, right, right. We can't rely on all these services that are sitting out there. Yeah. Um, well, we also saw, uh, and I love the story at Squarespace, where these guys, they were actually Pier 1 hosting, didn't go down, but the pump to put the diesel into their uh, generator on the roof went down. So these guys were hauling diesel fuel up 17 flights of <laughs> in stairs. In buckets, right? In buckets. They had a bucket brigade. Yeah. You know, yeah. everybody had two floors and they went up. You know, Jonathan, one of the things that I think one of the most innovative things that uh, I know you put together a lot of innovative stuff in your career would was when you did the uh, data center in a shipping container, which I thought was brilliant. You could take that thing and drop it out anywhere. Um, would that have helped in New York? And are people using it there? Uh, well, I don't know. You don't know because um, you're not I, there I, anymore. I've been, right? It's been a while. <laughs> you know, I, it, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to stand up spare capacity, absolutely it'll help. But I think the issue for folks wasn't just having capacity. It was having their apps and having their data. Yeah. And if that's stuck in the data center, that's not necessarily moving around. I think, you know, one of the things I just found surprising was I absolutely understand and I'm... And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very sensitive to the, the, the issues that, that people face, the data centers and businesses especially. But seeing the NYSE and the NASDAQ go down, you know, that, that's not like Trello. Yeah, right. You know, that, that's like the backplane of global commerce. And for that to be geographically vulnerable, I mean, can you imagine there being a bad weather system and Google going out? Yeah, and it, it, it was, was really just, interesting that they had, like, in order for the NYSE to come back, they actually had to bring the people back, right? Yeah. They actually had to put the people up downtown so they could return the exchange 
back into service, which, wow, there's people there? Yeah. Still? Yeah. Really? I thought the bell was a digital bell, but again, <laughs> apparently it's not going to Somebody's got to actually <laughs> ring it, right? Uh, is this uh, tend to invalidate a lot of the cloud stuff we're relying on these days, Nathan? Well, you know, it, it's a good question because I think the amount of people in New York that lost power was about equal to, uh, like, Australia. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's not a joke. I mean, this is a big, wow. big thing. So, you know, we're, we're living our lives more and more in the cloud. I know basically all my stuff's up there. I'm, I'm not even really relying that much on local storage. I, I use a Chromebook a, a lot. Book, which, I'm like one of the few yeah. reporters that I see actually doing that. So uh, I think it's a totally fair question because, you know, if something um, were to happen and and you can have you can have remote servers, you can have off-site locations, you can have other options on entirely different uh, power grids, but it, it's, it's a scary thought. Yeah. I, and I don't think it, it, it doesn't invalidate the cloud in the least. What it invalidates is single points of failure. Single points of failure right. <laughs> don't do that. Have a backup. Right. You always have, have a backup for your backup. <laughs> right. Don't just put it all in New York. Put it yeah, out right. in LA. Right. Put it in have Texas a cloud Coast. next to your cloud. <laughs> put it in Kansas City. So you're a consumer, right? You're yeah. a homeowner. Um, what would your advice for them to be? Should they take some of those enterprise skills and apply move them? your data into a cloud service? Find the right services for you. But you know, I, I, the example I gave was a decade ago. I was with my parents. They they used to live outside of D.C. and and I asked my mom about this particular photograph, so she went and got me this box of photographs, and she's showing me pictures of my grandfather. And she, you know, she holds one up, and she says, you know, this is one of the three photographs that exist of him. That's pretty wild. And, and, and it's I, in her hand. And it's right? in her hand, and, and she's got all these photographs, and I say, are there copies of this? She's like, no, these are, these are the only ones. And it was in the basement, and you know, the basement flooded now and then. Yeah. So I took the whole box, went back to California at the time, scanned them all, put them up on the web, sent out you know, 100 DVDs to every family member I could think about. Why? For redundance. Mm -hmm. And you know, do I really care that I don't have the original paper? I, I'm not yeah, all that worried about not. it. So for the data that matters to you, move it somewhere so that in the event your house goes away, you've still got access to it. I mean, can you imagine running your own mail server? Well, don't do the same with your photographs or with your children's core information or secrets or whatever. Move them. Yeah, really good advice. Move it to the cloud, whether it's through your new service, whether it's through Dropbox, whether it's using a Chromebook or whatever. And there are lots and Absolutely. lots of great options out there. Yeah, good. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, really, you know, Jonathan, I, I just wish you would blog more these days. So, can yeah, I get you I, to blog more? No, you can. I, and I actually pointed out in a recent interview, one of the reasons I stopped blogging was I got a little bit of a nasty grant from Oracle saying, ah, ah, ah. Oh, really? So yeah. I think that's going to begin changing in another couple of weeks or so. So it's Jonathan I. Schwartz at WordPress.com. I'm there really looking forward. You are an aw amazing. When I was running PC Magazine, I, we always just said, we should get him to be one of our columnists. And then we realized it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Yeah. But. It would have been. It would have been awesome, um, Nathan. You've got a lot of great new phones and stuff. That you were, you uh, well. This is the Samsung uh, Note Galaxy Note Two. Galaxy Note Two. Which, I'm actually testing that one for review right now. So you're going to be reviewing this. You yep. can find lots of good stuff over at uh, Gadget Lab at Wired. This is the Nexus Four. The review went up today. And that's the device that you want. You've also got the review up of the Nexus Galaxy. Uh, Nexus wait, Ten. I can't keep these things straight. Nexus, the Nexus 10, Ten. Nexus Four. Nexus, Nexus 7, Four. Galaxy Note Two. Note. All coming up. Thank you guys. Cheers. And that's it for another episode of Downloaded. Thanks. Thanks for coming.